I hope, I hope you catch the significance, for example, of this presentation my wife gave this afternoon. Vital and important in the sense that as you read the Book of Mormon, some of us, some of us take a chronological view from 1 Nephi, I Nephi, born of goodly parents, to Moroni chapter 10. And we look at it from that standpoint. But as you see the message of the Book of Mormon, that message blossoms in Nephi. And then you see another tremendous amplification of it by the Savior. And in, in one manner of speaking, the revelations given to Nephi constitute the key, the original, the initial key of insight to the whole thing. Or now, as it relates to our day, then uh, the Book of Mormon, the major prophetic theme of that sacred volume, concerns an era of warfare against Zion, in which era Zion will be sanctified and rise to be the full standard that the Lord designs the saints to be. And then that program that's established among them will eventually be extended to Jerusalem in the great winding up scene, uh, preliminary to the second coming and associated with the second coming. Now in the warfare against Zion then, the great prophetic theme, the Book of Mormon, there are two divisions to it. First of all, there's the era of warfare against the Latter-day Saints or Zion, and that's the initial thrust. And the second division is the shifting of uh, uh, military tactics from Zion to Jerusalem. And uh, the consummating scene in Jerusalem. For example, uh, and this is a key not just in the Book of Mormon, but it's a key to the whole biblical prophecy. You read the second chapter of Joel about the great northern army. We'll say a little more about it tonight. The second chapter of Joel deals with Zion, the warfare against Zion. Chapter 3 in the book of Joel focuses on the Jerusalem phase of it. See, And so Joel in his revelation gives us first of all his prophetic message concerning Zion and then his prophetic message concerning Jerusalem. So that this whole era of warfare that finally consummates in the second coming of Christ is appearance on the Mount of Olives and his grand world appearance in glory subsequently, shortly after that, then it has these two major divisions, the era of warfare against Zion and the era of warfare against Jerusalem. Are we clear on that? Now the Book of Mormon then gives us that orientation, sets the mold, and helps us to understand. And it's a part, then, of Nephi's vision, and it's one of Nephi's looks, for those of you here this afternoon, where the angel says, look, and reveals things to him. Let me turn you with you now, then, to 1 Nephi chapter 14. Now, let's start right from the beginning. It came to pass, it shall come to pass, that if the Gentiles, and note the little uh, word if, if the Gentiles shall hearken unto the Lamb of God in that day that he shall manifest himself unto them in word and also in power in very deed unto the taking away of their stumbling blocks and harden not their hearts against the Lamb of God, they shall be numbered among the seed of thy father, that is of Lehi. Yea, they shall be numbered among the house of Israel and they shall be a blessed people upon the promised land forever. Now that's a great promise. And they shall be no more brought down into captivity, and the house of Israel shall no more be confounded. And that great pit which hath been digged for them by the great and abominable church, which was founded by the devil and his children, that he might lead away the souls of men down to hell, yea, that great pit which has been digged for the destruction of men shall be filled by those who digged it. 
unto their utter destruction, saith the Lamb of God. Not the destruction of the soul, save it be the casting of it into hell, which hath no end. For behold, this is according to the captivity of the devil, and also according to the justice of God upon all those who will work wickedness and abominations before me. Now, do you begin to get the picture there? He's talking about the latter-day Gentiles and about certain basic alternatives that are open to them. And uh, if they obey the gospel, receive the kingdom, receive the Book of Mormon, repent of their sins, they'll be a blessed people on this land forever, and they'll never be brought down into captivity. Now he goes on to say, And it came to pass that the angel said unto me, Nephi, uh, spake unto me, Nephi, saying, Thou hast beheld that if the Gentiles repent, it shall be well with them, and thou hast also knowest concerning the covenants of the Lord unto the house of Israel. And thou also hast heard that whosoever repenteth not must perish. Now, he's being very realistic with him. Therefore, woe be unto the Gentiles if it so be that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. For the time cometh saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and a marvelous work among the children of man, a work which shall be everlasting either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing of them unto peace and eternal and life eternal, or unto the deliverance of them to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, unto their being brought down into captivity and also into destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil of which I have spoken." Now, what he's doing is giving the Gentiles up alternatives. And those alternatives are to repent, embrace the gospel, and be a blessed people upon this land forever. And then he's saying, now, if they don't, then there's going to come a time, and these alternatives aren't really presented yet. Let me make that point clear. In a general way, yes, but in a specific way, no. These alternatives, in a general way, are presented because the church is here, the missionary work is going forth, and the Gentiles have opportunity to receive it. But in the sense now that Nephi is talking about it, the presentation of these alternatives to the Gentiles is still a future thing. Now, there is a very, very valuable key of insight. We'll come back to it a little later. All right, now, speaking now of this future period when these alternatives will be very real to the Gentiles and presented with vividness and with power and be of such a nature that if they refuse them, they will be brought down to destruction both temporally and spiritually. Now, we haven't seen that situation yet. But if they then reject the Lord's work, when his Canaan is presented to the degree that Nephi indicates, then the consequence will be rather rapid. And they'll be brought down, as he says, into captivity and also on destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil. Now, there's a future era that we call the era of warfare against Zion. And in a sense, the Gentiles have been making war against it since Joseph Smith got out of, the, out of the sacred drove. In a sense, they have. But there is this future period that uh, the Book of Mormon speaks of, and it's in this context that these two alternatives will be very viable and very meaningful to the people of this land. All right, now, with that introduction, let's go now to verse 9. And it came to pass that he said unto me, Look, and here's one of Nephi's looks, okay? And behold the great and abominable church, which is the mother of abomination, whose foundation is the devil. And he said unto me, Behold, there are, save, two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God. And I mean to say parenthetically, that is not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the entirety of all of its members. I'll just say that for now, and then we'll come back. I want you to, to get that on your mind and be thinking about it. The one, then, is the, chur is, the, is the Church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the Church of the Devil. And then he explains what the Church of the Devil is. 
And it has no uh, identity with a given single organization on this earth. Note how he explains it. He says, Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great and abominable church, which is the mother of abomination, and she is the whore of all the earth. Now, who then uh, is the church of the devil? And the answer is that it's anyone who is not identified with, supportive of, part of the program of the Church of the Lamb. Okay? Now you say, now, how will that be? Well, let me just put another uh, picture in here for the present, and we'll come back to that in, in uh, particularly tomorrow as we discuss it. As Nephi deals with this prophetic theme now, and he comes uh, uh, in the future to it, here in Second uh, Nephi, for instance, chapter 30, verse 10, he says this, And the time speedily cometh that the Lord shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked he will destroy, and he will spare his people. Yea, even if it so be that he must destroy the wicked by fire. Now, there's going to come a great division. That division will be so complete and so thorough in the forces of animosity or of righteousness, one on the one hand and one on the other, that there will be a total division. And in that day, the gospel of Christ will be talked about worldwide as it has never been talked about. In that day, uh, there will be a polarity largely of world society, either for or against the kingdom. Now you say, well, that's a great big idea, and it is, but let's get to the main theme and then see finally how this comes about. All right, so he sees then these two churches, and he sees the great division. And he sees that whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb will be in the other camp and will be a part of the great and the abominable church. Now, that's not one single organization, is it? That organization is not founded in external uh, mechanisms and systems. It is essentially a spiritual thing, whether they accept or reject. The kingdom. Now he goes on and gives us a little further uh, explanation of the picture. He says, It came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth, and she sat upon the many waters. Now that word waters is a scriptural word. It comes from uh, Isaiah 18, and it also comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 15. And it means scripturally people. Waters mean people, okay? She sat upon the many waters, and uh, she had dominion over all the earth, among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Now, he's not talking of just one organization. He's talking about something that's spiritually oriented, an attitude, a mindset, a cultural set uh, that is uh, rather embracive all the earth, and so forth. And then he says, It came to pass that I beheld that the church of the Lamb of God and its members were few because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon the many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, who were, the, uh, were also upon all the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. Now you begin to get the picture there. Now this picture could not be fulfilled uh, prior to World War II. Now why? The policy of the church prior to World War II was to do what? If you got converted in Germany or if you got converted in France or Italy, what did you do? 
you migrated to America. You see that? And then beginning with some declarations made by George Albert Smith and put into operation rather fully by President David O. McKay following World War II, this church then became an international organization. President McKay had toured the world, and that world tour wasn't just for vacations. Right after World War II, he uh, went down into Central and South America. I have uh, had a, mich a, a neighbor friend of mine uh, who was on a mission at the same time I was. I was in the old East Central States mission. And this friend of mine went down to Argentina right after World War uh, II. I got out of the military one day and was interviewed the next day for a mission and was on my way within a month. And, uh, but I went to good old Kentucky, North Carolina, as they say. And uh, he went to Argentina. And while he was there in Argentina, he spent two years clapping at doors. That's how you knock in Argentina, and he never got into one home. Now, I don't know how discouraging that would be. I had a great time. Uh, I don't know how to quite meet that kind of a challenge. And then President McKay went down there and dedicated the land, and everything just seemed to open up in Central and South America. Everything just seemed to open up, and the gospel uh, just went forward. I was in Mexico City once, and I was talking with a a young, about 19-year-old boy who had got fire with the gospel, and he had baptized 400 people. And the measly 60 or so that I baptized in East Central States Mission seemed paltry to me in comparison with that young boy who didn't even have a pair of shoes on. And I was ready to take off my shoes because I thought I was standing on holy ground. See? Well, the gospel opens up. And then the counsel of the church is to do what? Stay where you are and gather to the stakes there. You see that? And build up organizations there. And then on top of that kind of program, then we have temples begin to dot the area. And so we have them on the drawing boards almost by the dozens. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but we've seen many, many temples in the last few years, see? And we see them built in foreign lands. And yes, they're there for the convenience of the saints. Yes, they're there for the work of the saints in regard to their dead. But they're also there for another reason. And I want to talk to you about that one. That's a part of this warfare against Zion picture. All right, and so he sees now these, this polarization. And as I've said, this polarization in Nephi's vision could not be fulfilled until sometime subsequent to World War II. And the great things of which he speaks in relation to this polarization are still down the road, not very far. We won't get through the next decade before we're neck deep in what he's talking about here. Believe me. Now he goes on and he says this. And it came to pass, verse 13, that I beheld that the great mother of abominations did gather together multitudes upon the face of all the earth, among all the nations of the Gentiles, primarily among Western culture, the peoples of Western culture, to fight against the Lamb of God. Now that is the warfare against Zion, and that is the major prophetic theme of this sacred book, the Book of Mormon, that President Benson wants us to understand. Now he goes on and he says this in explanation, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord. Now I said that the church of the Lamb isn't identically equivalent to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Church of the Lamb constitutes the righteous element within the Church. And that righteous element 
and we have a lot of hanger oners and we have a lot of social Mormons and what I call Kiwanis Mormons, good people, but they think the church is a Kiwanis club, and that's a compliment to the Kiwanis club. But they think that that's about all it is, is the social and the, the good humanitarian uh, organization. It's not the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not being born again and changed and transformed. And it's not ministering the power of the Holy Spirit. It's visiting and talking about the weather and the corn and uh, anything else that might be a common topic, see. Now, there's a difference between ministering the gospel and visiting, something like visiting the sick and afflicting them. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that sometimes happens. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Church of the Lamb now is that body of people when this pressure situation happens who will meet the challenge head-on spiritually and by their faith and their righteousness and their service and their building the kingdom and their commitment to the kingdom, then the power of the Lamb of God will descend upon them and also upon the covenant people of the Lord, and that will include Jewish people who are converted at that time. He says, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now, sometimes when the wolf is at the door, just the pressure of it unites people. We've got a lot of Latter-day Saints, moreover in the area of Latter-day complaints and ain'ts, but we've got a lot of them, and sometimes we're part of that too much, uh, who uh, would rather die for the gospel than to live for it. And when a pressure situation comes where maybe you have to die for it, then there will be a lot of people who will rise to its defense, at least in some way. But uh, what I'm saying now is that when this situation comes upon us, and it's not very far down the road. When this situation comes upon us, then those people who truly live the gospel and who truly sanctify themselves, you don't get the power of God and great glory just because someone gets emotional over the church. You don't get that. You might get some emotion and support on the basis of, of righteous uh, indignation and uh, uh, support in a physical way. But we're not talking about that only. We're talking about people now who meet the challenge of being sanctified and getting the endowments of the Spirit and the blessings of the Second Comforter, etc., etc., see. And this power and this Spirit that will be made manifest among them will be visibly made manifest because it will be so intense. It will be made manifest in a sense of defense. Now this takes then not only faith and righteousness, it takes the ordinances of the gospel, and it takes the temple and the blessings of the house of the Lord, and the great objective now is finally that under adversity such as Nephi sees, that Zion will rise and be the standard of righteousness in the world that is designed to be. Now, Zion as a standard must be a Zion endowed with glory. Over in Isaiah chapter 4, and this is one of the chapters that, that Nephi quotes in its entirety in the Book of Mormon and says it pertains to the last days. And it's one that the angel Moroni, by the way, also quoted to Joseph Smith and explained to him in September of 1823, according to Oliver Cowdery's account at least. And... Uh, in that sense, then, uh, Isaiah talks about the time where uh, the Lord will endow Zion. He will create upon every dwelling place in Mount Zion and upon all her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the flaming of fire by night. The spirit and power will be that concentrated, see? Now, that doesn't come just because you exercise zeal uh, over uh, the zeal of indignation over oppression of an innocent people. That comes because people learn finally to sanctify their lives. And in this pressure situation, when that happens, this action will begin. 
And they look back at us with our rather lackadaisical, all as well in Zion attitude, and wonder why we didn't awake earlier. All right, so Nephi then sees this era of warfare, and he sees it then taking place among all the nations, particularly of the Gentiles. So that if you have a little church organized, for example, over in Germany, or France, or Italy, or England, or Scotland, or Wales, then you're going to see people in those whole areas gather against them. And this isn't just the media, and it isn't just a few bricks and a club or two. We're talking about warfare, general, gen, of bona fide warfare, genuine stuff, the good old stuff, bona fide warfare against Zion. Okay? And then he sees that one means of preserving them will be the manifestation of the Lord's glory and power among them. Now he talks about another one here in verse 15. It came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon the great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. Now, all the nations is how inclusive, and that will include our beloved America. It's one of the nations, and one of the foremost. And it will be the first great nation, if we understand the Book of Mormon thoroughly, that makes warfare against Zion. Okay? Now, as you see this picture then, then Nephi sees or is shown that it's in this era that the Lord prepares, does the preparatory work. And I underscore the word preparatory. It's the preparatory work, not, not the real work. It's getting ready. He sees that it's in this era that the Lord does the preparatory work for the gathering of Israel. Now, see, the great gathering of Israel really hasn't taken place yet. Yes, we've gathered a few of Ephraim. It's got underway in that sense. But if you want to see what the gathering of Israel is about, turn over, for example, to 3 Nephi 20 and to 3 Nephi 21, where the Savior himself explains what the picture is. Here in 3 Nephi 20, for example, he's... Uh, talking about uh, the building of Zion. Then in verse 41, he says, And then shall a cry go forth, Depart, ye depart, ye go ye out from thence. Touch not that which is unclean. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be in your, be your rearward. And then he goes on to talk about that. Now he comes back to that same theme in 3 Nephi 21, where he talks about possible judgments on America, then the building of the new Jerusalem, and then the power of God which is developed among them. Then verse 25 of 3 Nephi 21, Then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in their midst. And this is part of the second coming. It's, it's a preliminary appearance. We need to look more closely than the grand world appearance of his coming in glory because he will come to Zion apparently years and years before he comes to the world in glory. And this is one of those preliminary appearances. And he says, Then shall the work of the Father commence at that day, verse 26, when this gospel shall be preached among the remnants of this people. Verily I say unto you, At that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people. Yea, even the tribes which have been lost. Now, here's the ten tribes coming in, which the Father hath led away out of Jerusalem. Yea, the work shall commence among all the dispersed of my people with the Father to prepare the way whereby they may come unto me, that they may call on the Father in my name. Yea, and then shall the work commence with the Father among all nations in preparing the way whereby his people may be gathered home to the land of their inheritance. And note this again now. They they shall, not go, they shall go out from all nations, and they shall not go out in haste, nor go by flight, for I will go before them, saith the Father, and I will be their rearward. Now, that's the great gathering, you see. 
Sometimes think that the gathering is over. No, we're in this interim period where we're building churches in foreign lands and building temples and preparing now for this time of warfare against Zion. And when that time comes, then the gathering of Israel will take place. Now, Nephi has shown that here in 1 Nephi 14. Let me read with you now again, beginning now with verse 15. Let's go back one verse. It came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon the great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. And, there all, and as there began to be wars and rumors of wars among the, the nations, all the nations, which belonged to the mother of abominations, the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the mother of harlots, and behold, thou seest all these things. Now, verse 17 is one of those verses in the Book of Mormon that you need to read over and over again. And be sure that you understand. Let's just see if we can get to it. He gives us here in verse 17 a point of reference, a time when something is going to take place. He says, And when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots. Now, that statement indicates that, that he's giving us a point of time and of reference when something else will happen. When the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose foundation is, at the de is the devil, then at that day the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way. Now note, this is not doing it. This is a preparatory work. Shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are the house of Israel. Now he's going to prepare the way. Now the great gathering of Israel is not just a physical gathering. It's a gathering to Zion. It's a gathering to the gospel. It's a gathering to the temple. And it will be ultimately and finally a gathering to the endowment of glory and power. Now in order to prepare for that, that gathering, initially then, is going to be to Zion, to Mount Zion, and that's on this land. And uh, if the Lord is going to prepare then for that great gathering, which isn't just to get their bodies physically to America, that gathering now is to gather to his law, to his doctrine, to his program, to Zion, to the spiritual renewal that the gospel offers, to the endowment of glory to the blessings of the house of the Lord, to the sealing powers, and all of these things. See, it's that kind of gathering. It's a gathering to the law of consecration. It's a gathering to the holy order of the temple. See, it's that kind of gathering. Now, in order to prepare for that, as we look at it from this vantage point, two things are necessary. Number one, there's got to be a cleansing of the saints. Why? Because we're just not cutting it. That's why. And it isn't just because we're a little lackadaisical. Uh, Isaiah says that Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. The prophet Joseph Smith says a man cannot come to Mount Zion except by suffering. There's got to be a refiner's fire. In the Book of Mormon, for example, the Savior quotes Malachi, the third and fourth chapters. Now, I don't know why he would quote it there, because we got it in the Bible, and he knew that we would have it in the Bible. And so you say, why did he put Malachi 3 and 4 in there? And uh, they're prophetic about our day. But I think if you'll study the Book of Mormon carefully, you'll find out why. See, in 3 Nephi, he talks about, he plants the gospel, and he talks about the last days, he talks about the building of the new Jerusalem, and about the establishment of his uh, the church and his government and his kingdom here upon this land. And then he wants us to be very sure that we know how this is going to take place. Now in Malachi chapter 3, Malachi says, I will, I will uh, send my messenger. 
And he says, uh, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now that coming to the temple, according to section 42, is the Jackson County Temple. But then he asks this question, But who shall abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, and he will purify and purge the sons of Levi, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. All right, now in order to build Zion, the righteous Latter-day Saints need to be refined. Not just the inactives, but the righteous. And one thing the Lord is going to accomplish then in this era of warfare is the refinement of his people so that they become an obedient, totally, not only totally obedient, but to the extent that they can feel as he wants them to feel and be pure as he wants them to be pure. And so he's talking now about a preparation, verse 17 again, when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church, when that day cometh, then shall the work of the Father commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants. Now that preparation, as I've said, is twofold. Number one, it's a cleansing of the saints, a purifying of the saints. And I'm not talking about uh, the inactives only. I'm talking about the righteous who will be subjected to the refiner's fire so that they can get the greater endowments of the spirit that the Lord has for them and that Nephi sees is poured out upon the saints when, when warfare is made against them and which is necessary, finally, for Zion to come up and be the standard that the scriptures speak of, with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Okay? Now that's one thing that has to be done. The second thing that has to be done is the cleansing of America. Now why the cleansing of America? Well, because this is the land of Zion. And uh, if the Gentiles, after due season, will not repent, so as to make the transition and build up the kingdom and spread the kingdom abroad peacefully on the basis of the gospel of peace and love and unity, then the Lord finally is going to come out in judgment. And when he does, this cesspoolism that we are in the midst of today and to which our young people are subjected particularly is going to be cleansed away. as. The Savior himself says, all lyings and deceivings and endings and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away on this land. People who think they are riding in the saddle on this uh, floodgate of dissipation are going to be sadly mistaken. Now the Lord has said he's going to do that. And unless he wants to offer an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to have to do it. So there's got to be a cleansing of this land. Now, when the saints are refined and purified, and when this land is cleansed and purified, then the kingdom of God will be established. And then Zion will be endowed with glory. And then we will have an order of things on this land. And then the gathering of Israel will take place. And they'll go out from among all nations. And they'll not go in haste, but they will go peacefully, slowly, bringing as many people with them, and they will have the endowments of the Spirit like ancient Israel had as they left Egypt, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And they will come to Zion singing songs of everlasting joy. Now that is the prophetic picture of the Book of Mormon. And we're on the very threshold of the beginning of that tremendous era of time. All right, now having seen this then, the whole scene shifts and it says, It came to pass that the angel spake unto me, saying, Look, and here's another one of those looks. And I looked and beheld a man, and he was, uh, and he was dressed in a white robe. And the angel said unto me, Behold, one of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Behold, he shall see and write the remainder of these things, and yea, and also many things which have been. And he shall also write concerning the end of the world, 
Wherefore, the things which he shall write are just and true, and behold, they are written in the book which thou beheld proceeded from the mouth of the Jew, that is, the Bible. And at the time they proceeded out of the mouth of the Jew, or at the time the book proceeded out of the mouth of the Jew, the things which were written were plain and pure and most precious and easy to the understanding of all men. And behold, the things which this apostle of the Lamb shall write are many things which thou hast seen, talking to Nephi. And behold, the remainder shalt thou see. So Nephi saw in his vision clear on down everything that John the Revelator saw. And all to others have, uh, have, who have been, to them hath he shown all things, and they have written them, and they are sealed up to come forth in their purity, particularly the brother of Jared. And this is a part of the great uh, content, then, of the sealed portion. And he says, And I, Nephi, heard and bear record that the name of the apostle of the Lamb was John, according to the words of the angel. All right, now what's Nephi's vision then got to do with the book of Revelation? Well, they're talking about the same thing. Nephi couldn't write it all, but what he wrote here in 1 Nephi 14 and his commentaries, for example, in 1 Nephi 22, Jacob's commentary in 2 Nephi 6, the Savior's explanations in 3 Nephi 16, 20, and 21, and so on, all of these then help us and give us foundation to understand the book of Revelation, which, by the way, Joseph said was the plainest book God ever caused to be written. And that's true. I bury my testimony. That's true. And you can say it yourself. Okay? Now, we want to talk about the Nephi vision tonight. We want to talk about the Isaiah aspects. Every time most of us go through the Book of Mormon hit an Isaiah passage, what do we do? You skip it, or else if you're really religious, you'll just get your eyeballs over it, and when you get through, you won't know much more than when you started, but you will have had the satisfaction of wrestling through and knowing that you read every word. And that's the way it is, right? Now, let me tell you something. The Isaiah passages contained some of the most sacred, meaningful, relevant things that the Lord has given to us in the Book of Mormon. And that's true. So tomorrow night, we're going to talk about Isaiah and tackle Isaiah, okay? And then Saturday night, I want to come right back to 1 Nephi 14 and roll it through the book of Revelation and show you how plain it is and how simple it is and how important that record is to the basic uh, program of the last days and how we need to begin to understand it. All right. Uh, let me move on. In the latter day, and we'll take John now, since John the Revelator has seen the things that Nephi saw, there are two major powers that will finally make war against the house of Israel, Zion and the house of Israel. Two major powers. Uh, let me turn with you, for example, and we'll get a little sneak preview here on the book of Revelation. We won't take time to discuss this Saturday night because we, we're going to run out of time before we get through it here, believe me. Uh, now, let's turn now to, first to, to Revelation chapter 13. Here we have a spotlight given to us on the two major powers that oppose the kingdom of God in the latter day. And John writes as follows. He says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his uh, horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, if you study those terms and those symbols in other places of uh, the book of Revelation, you find that they have to do with latter-day Babylon. Uh, with those forces that uh, are generally associated with what we call Western civilization or with modern-day Christendom and uh, the nations of modern-day Christendom. How as he sees this beast, and it's the figure of a beast, it's a symbol showing then the, the kind of character of these powers, 
Uh, he says, The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power, and his seat on great authority. And then he goes on and says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. All right, he goes on and talks about him. Verse 7, it, came, it was given him power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, now we'll talk a little more about these symbolism just a little bit later. I want to show you their meaning and how they relate. In verse 11 now, having seen this first beast, then he says this, And I beheld another beast, now there's two of them then, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like the lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the powers of the first beast before him, and caused the earth, and them which dwelt thereon to worship the first beast. See, these two beasts are correlated and related. Uh, his deadly heen, a wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven, on the earth in the sight of men, see, there's, there's power in respect to the adversary that's made manifest. Uh, let me just add this point of clarification. When Zion begins to arise with glory and power, so that there's visible power made manifest, and the glory begins to be made manifest as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, then the Lord will permit Satan to, to manifest an equivalent opposing force. And this is the day when that takes place. Now he goes on and speaks of this latter-day beast, indicating he shall cause both the small and the great, rich and the poor, bond and free, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and uh, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast. Now that's not talking about America. They may, they may make an effort to do that kind of thing in America. But this is talking about a situation that prevails in the great and abominable church vicinity or area or domain, and it'll be after the redemption of Zion. See, it's that period. So, all right. But the point I want to make out now, to that, right at this time, is that there are two beasts that are spoken of, and uh, the, John describes. Now let's turn to Daniel chapter seven. Now, what's Daniel seven all about? What's the significance of Daniel 7? What, what great message does Daniel 7 contain? Well, it's in Daniel 7 that Daniel has shown the great counsel of Adam on Diamond in the last days. That's the significance of Daniel 7. And uh, in addition to that great counsel, he has also shown the world situation and the forces of corruption and of evil in that day that will be making war against Zion. And so the Daniel 7 picture isn't merely about the council. It's also about the situation that prevails within the earth. Now that council is important. For example, here's what the prophet Joseph said about it, teachings page 157. He says, Daniel in his seventh chapter speaks of the Ancient of Days. He means the oldest man, our father Adam, Michael. He will call his children together and hold a council with them to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man. Now this is a preparatory council. We'll get to that a little later in the week of the meaning now of Adam on Diamon. Uh, he goes on to say some of the things that take place uh, in respect to the delivering of keys, the judgment, the preparations that are necessary. But let me now turn to Daniel 7 itself, and let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, again, we've said now that there are two major powers in the last days that uh, uh, oppose Zion. And this picture again comes out and is made evident or manifest very clearly in uh, uh, the book of Daniel. Daniel begins, for example, with uh, uh, this statement. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. 
Then he wrote the dream and told uh, the sum of the matter. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts. Now these beasts are symbols, figures. Joseph Smith makes it clear in his discourse on the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation that they're they should be translated figures of a beast, and they represent beastly systems or degenerate systems, systems that are carnal, systems that are opposed to God. Uh, so he sees then four great beasts come out of the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion, and then he goes on for brevity's sake, you can read the rest. The second was like a bear, the third was like a leopard. And the fourth then uh, was terrible and had much power, and uh, it uh, had ten horns and so forth. Okay? Now, Daniel 7 deals with the same subject in general that Daniel 2 deals with. We're all familiar, are we not, with Daniel's vision of the great image with the head of gold the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and then representing the downward flow of things from the upper to the lower legs, from the Roman Empire to the so-called Holy Roman Empire, which Voltaire said was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, till you finally then get to the feet and the toes. Now the head of gold is Babylon the chest and arms of the medio persian empire the belly and thighs brass the greeks or macedonian ushered in by alexander the great who conquered the world of his day and died with snakes in his boots at the tender age of 32 or 3. and then the roman empire which divides at constantinople and at rome as the body divides downward and then passing from there to the so-called holy roman empire which by the way was brought to a conclusion in 1806, finally terminated in 1806. And then he sees out of this system the latter-day national states, which emerge. And he says, Now in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And uh, he talks about it like a rock that's cut out of the mountain without hands. Uh, indicating that the Lord is going to do his work in that sense and is going to roll forth and fill the earth. Now, Daniel 7 is dealing with the same thing. These four beasts now represent the four major powers of the image. The first beast, like unto a lion, representative then of Babylon. The second, like unto a bear, representative then of the Medes and the Persians. The third, the leopard represents Greece. The fourth beast then, dreadful and terrible as the Roman Empire was, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now the word horn scripturally is a symbol of power. It had ten horns, and I considered the horns and behold, there came up one among them, among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like a man, and the mouth speaking great things. Now let me come back to these, to these four beasts. And let's turn again to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Now this, this first beast in the last days that Nephi, that that John rather sees is given certain characteristic marks. He says, for example, as he speaks of it, the beast which I saw, verse 2, was like unto a leopard. His feet was the feet of a bear. Mouth was the mouth of a lion. Now these are the same figures that Daniel uses, except what? They're reversed. They're reversed. He mentions the leopard first. Daniel mentions the leopard last. He mentions then the feet, which is like the bear, and then the mouth is like the lion. All right, now this latter-day beast, Babylon, culturally is a composite of past civilizations. 
It's a composite of Rome, of Greece, of uh, the Persians, Babylon, all of these things go into the melting pot of this latter-day system that we call Babylon. And so far as we are concerned now, the most pervasive influence in Babylon is what? It's not, I mean, latter-day Babylon. It's not the ancient Babylon. It's not the Medes and the Persians. It's Greek culture. And so he lists then the Greeks first, see? If you, for example, uh, get yourself a, a Ph.D. in modern history, you'll see how prominently emphasis is given, how much emphasis is given to Greece and to Rome. We have some people who try to say that essentially American democracy comes from those sources. Now, granted, there was a Greece and a Rome, granted the Founding Fathers knew all about them and studied them. But American freedom came from Christ. American freedom came from Christ. But Gra Babylon's great ideal is Greco-Roman philosophy. And so this latter-day beast, which is Babylon, the one that rises up and makes war against Zion, is a composite then of Greece, of the Persians, of Babylon. You see that? And he's so depicted. All right, now, that's the one beast. Now there's a second beast, and he sees that. He says, as I considered, and uh, there came up among them a little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And I beheld this little horn. In this little horn were eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. And then he gives us a little interlude and tells us now about the Adam on Diamond Council from verse 9 through verse 14. And he tells us about that council being held and when it's held and his work is finally in its final stages. Then Christ will make his appearance in that council, and there he will be crowned by the priesthood of all ages, all dispensations now united by this great council into the latter-day dispensation of the fullness of times to make, in fact, the dispensation of the fullness of times in its fullness, then Christ will come. And it says, uh, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and kingdoms and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away. And so in that council, then Christ comes, and by the priesthood of all ages in that sacred valley of Adam on Diamond, he's accepted, he's sustained by the vote of that council as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, is the second coming taking place yet? No, but they're prepared for it. And now Daniel then sees this scene, and he wants to know about it. And so he asked one of the angels standing there by, what are these four beasts all about? And the angel answers, verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse. Well, he, the angel tells him these four beasts are four kingdoms that are going to be arise in the earth. And then the fourth beast, he says, I want to know about him. And so he says, now this fourth beast then is going to be exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and these nails of brass, which devoured the breaking pieces and stamp the residue of the people and uh, his feet and so forth and the ten horns that were in his head had uh, in his head and the other which came up and before whom three fell even that horn which had eyes and uh, and a mouth that spake uh, great things whose look was more stout than his fellows i beheld that the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. All right, uh, and then he says, Thus he said, uh, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all other kingdoms. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first. Now let me see if we can just sort that out. He sees Babylon. He sees the Persians. He sees Greece. He sees Rome. He sees that out of Rome comes ten kings, and they're the same kingdoms that the feet and the toes of the image of Daniel typify and represent. Is that clear? That's just simple. And then he sees in that situation, right nearby but separate from it, 
the rise of what he calls a little horn. Now, this little horn is not little in the sense of power, because he immediately trounces the socks off in three of these other guys. Okay? So he's not little in the sense of power. He's little in the sense of duration in comparison with these, uh, this other system, which goes way back. And he rises then up and uh, uh, subdues three of the kingdoms of these ten horns that come out of Babylon. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith, for example, makes the statement, let me read it to you, concerning an interesting event that happens in the, in the future. This is a report uh, uh, coming from President John Taylor's father. In the uh, fall of 1842, because of opposition to him, the prophet withdrew from the public, and uh, uh, he would stay in the evenings in the Taylor home. And then in the daytime, he would knock around out in the woods and keep out of sight. And then in the evening, he'd go back and have his in, in evening meal, and they'd sit around and talk about the great things of the kingdom. And the prophet would retire to bed, and bright and early, he'd be up and out of the way in order to keep out of the mob. Now, one of those evening conversations is what we're talking about. He says, the old gentleman said that one time the prophet Joseph was in his house conversing about the Battle of Waterloo in which Father Taylor had taken part. Suddenly the prophet turned and said, Father Taylor, you will live to see, though I will not, greater battles than that of Waterloo. The United States, for example, will go to war with Mexico and thus will gain an increase of territory. Now, you know, the Mormon battalion is involved in that one. The slave question will cause a division between the North and the South. And in these wars, greater battles than Waterloo will, be, will, be, will occur in the Civil War, Gettysburg, for example. But, he continued with emphasis, when the great Russian bear lays his paw on the English lion, the winding up scene is not far off. Okay? Now, in this setting, you're talking about you're talking about the setting for the Adam on Diamond Council. Even today, we're making preparations at Adam on Diamond, aren't we? They're beautifying the place and they're fixing it up. Now, how soon that's going to take place, I don't know. But the brethren are working quietly, inoffensively, in that direction. Now, when that council is held, there will be two great world powers. One will be Babylon. And the other will be a little thing called the little horn. It'll be a mighty system, but it'll be called the little horn. And uh, it will subdue three of the kingdoms of the Babylon order, one of which will be England. So who's the little horn? The Russian bear. Okay? Now he goes on. And he sees this, and we need to see this picture because the Book of Mormon now opens this whole thing up. Really, it does. He sees now that this little horn makes war with the saints and prevails against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And then he goes on and sees that the ten horns are these ten kingdoms, and uh, he sees then the little horn but then the clarification is made, but judgment will shall sit, and that judgment will sit in Adam on Diamon. And they shall take away his dominion, the dominion of the little horn, who will have do dominated Babylon. That's the picture of, of, of the, the 13th chapter of Revelation, that the second power dominates the first and causes people to worship the first. All right? And... Uh, he says, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy to the end, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting king, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And that's the millennial system, see? Now, can you see how he's talking about the beginning on that? Now, let me turn to one other, a uh, couple of other areas. One is the, the book of Joel. You remember that the angel Moroni, when he came to the prophet Joseph Smith, quoted part of the book of Joel. Here's the prophet's record of it. 
here in his history here in the Pearl of Great Price. Verse uh, uh, 41, he says, He also quoted the second chapter of Joel from the 28th verse to the last. Now, that's important, from the 28th verse to the last. He also said that this was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be, that it was, it was in the agenda for the latter days. Now, as you turn to Joel 2, Joel talks about the pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh, and he begins this at verse 28. Let me read with you now what, uh, what he's saying. He says, And it shall come to pass afterward. Now put an underscore under that word afterward because this is a key. It should come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants, upon the handmaids of those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will shoot wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, and so forth. See, it shall come to pass afterward. After what? What do the first 28 verses or the first 27 verses deal with? They deal with the coming of a great northern power to Zion, to subdue Zion. And uh, the record says, for example, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mount. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, it's nigh at hand. Now he characterizes this great northern power First of all, as a northern army, verse 20, he speaks of it as a heathen power. It's not Christian. It's a heathen power, verse 17. And he also speaks of it in these words, that it will be such a power, quote, as there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. It's the greatest assembly of military might on the earth that has been or that will be till you get to the end of the millennial period. Now, what do those signs indicate? It's a northern army, and it's a heathen army, it's non-Christian, and it's the greatest military might of all time. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the little horn. Okay? Now, another point here. After this period of time, after this takes place, then the Lord says this in verse 30, 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For, out, for in Mount Zion, number one, and in Jerusalem, the second place, shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, whom the Lord shall call. There's a third place where there'll be security. Now, on one occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith took the second chapter of Joel and read the whole thing and then explained it. Let me say, read here basically what he said. We're talking about the teachings, page 70 and 71. He said he read the second chapter and then he explains it. And just to be brief, he says, but in the last days, God will call a remnant in which was to be deliverance as well as in Jerusalem and Zion. There's three places where there'll be some semblance of peace and of deliverance temporally. And he says, uh, uh, now if God should give no more revelation, where shall we find Zion and this remnant? If we don't know any more than what's in the Bible, where are we going to find this? The time is near when desolation is to cover the earth. Then God will have a place of deliverance in his remnant and in Zion and Jerusalem. Now he says that the Lord shall call, the remnant whom the Lord shall call, which I take means he hasn't called them yet, but he will. Now when these judgments come to America, when these judgments come to America, and uh, there's a disruption critically of our whole land and of our whole polity and economy. When that is over with, there will be only three places of deliverance. One of those will be Mount Zion. 
This will be among the saints who will, during that period of warfare, get sanctified, hopefully. Okay? The second will be the Jews, temporally. They'll establish themselves. The Jewish kingdom is only in its beginning stages. I mean, we've got more Jews in America than over there, but the time will come when I suspect they might be glad to, to leave. Not because I'm going to help them out, but because circumstances will, see. And uh, they'll gather to Jerusalem in far greater numbers. And then when this situation happens with America and the American system is broken, the Indian people, the Lord will call them. and They'll gather together and they will form some semblance of peace and order. And this order of things will prevail for a time. Okay, now one other prophecy, then we've got to quit for the time. And this is from the Book of Mormon now and from uh, some of its uh, statements in the Isaiah prophecies, which most of us, as we all admit, hastily read over and kind of leave. Now, we all know that the word Babylon has two connotations, don't we? We know that it has to do with an ancient kingdom way back when, in the days of Daniel, the days of ancient Israel. And it was an actual force on the earth, a mighty kingdom, walled 300 feet high around the city, wide enough at the top so you could drive, drive a couple of chariots across. See? And uh, this was a mighty building of the gardens of Babylon, the wonder, one of the wonders of the world. See, Now, we all know about that. But we also know that when you read the word Babylon, that we have to go through a kind of a mental process and ask ourselves, is that talking about anciently or modernly? And we know that Babylon refers to the latter day, right? That there is a latter day Babylon. And it takes its character from the symbol of the early Babylon. Splendor, glory, worldliness, all of that, see? And there's a latter day Babylon. And so when we talk about Babylon in the latter day, we have no problem with that. We know that there's such a thing, okay? All right, how many of us know that there's such a thing as the Assyrian? Now, Assyria anciently consisted of a militaristic people up north of Israel. It was Shalmaneser who subdued the northern kingdom of Israel and took them captive and uh, destroyed that whole northern kingdom, took them captive for a time until finally Nineveh, the uh, capital of ancient Assyria, fell. And when Nineveh fell, then those captive Israelites took advantage of that and they fled out of there. They moved up between the Black and the Caspian Sea through the Caucasus Mountains and they dumped off into the southern part of Europe and that's how we get to be the blood of Israel. And then there was apparently a group of them that said, hey, we want to really live the covenants like we've never done before and they took off somewhere into the Northland. And as the Book of Mormon indicates, they still existed as, as a group. All right, now in that sense then, uh, Assyria then was a militaristic power. How many of us know though that there is a latter day Assyrian? Now Isaiah talks about him. Let me turn for instance here to 2 Nephi chapter 18. And let's get just a few things on this in relation and keep in mind now, when Nephi puts these chapters of Isaiah in there, he's not putting a history lesson here. He's saying these chapters, and he says it clearly, these chapters pertain to the last days. And I'm putting them in here so that you can read them, and we'll talk about this now tomorrow, so that you can read and understand that they relate to the last days. And so here they are and understand them. So this is not the book of Isaiah now. This is what Nephi selects and puts in. Now note what he says. Now therefore, talking about people then being somewhat obstinate, therefore behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many. Now the word waters means what? People. Even the king of Assyria and all his glory and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks and he shall pass through Judah and he shall overflow and go over and he shall reach even to the neck 
Now, we'll clarify tomorrow evening that Judah has more than one meaning, and here then it applies then to a country, and uh, the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. So he's talking about, uh, about a power that's going to come up. Now, in chapter uh, 20 of third Nephi, I mean of second Nephi, beginning with verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is their indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take a prey and to tread them down like mire in the street. Howbeit he means not so, he doesn't think he's doing my will, neither doth his heart think so, but in his heart it is to destroy and cut off nations not a few. And uh, then he talks about that again. Now I'll turn over to chapter, verse 24 and verse 27 with me. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion. All right, now he's talking about us. Be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. In other words, he will do to you like Pharaoh did to the ancient Egyptian, ancient Israelites. He will, he, uh, will lift up his staff against thee <coughs> after the manner of Egypt. He says, For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease. And mine anger in their destruction, and the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And you go back in Old Testament and read about that. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he be lifted up after the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken off from thy shoulders, speaking of Zion, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And then he finally, to go back here and pick up a, a further statement in the same chapter, verse 12 to 15, he says, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and upon Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the Assyrian, of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, By the strength of my hand, and by my wisdom I have done these things, for I am prudent, and I have moved the borders of the people, and I have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man, and my hand hath found uh, as the nest of the riches of the people, and so forth. And then the Lord says, Hey, don't you know that, that I have all things under my control? Now when he says, for example, that after he has completed his whole work upon Mount Zion. What is his work upon Mount Zion? And Jerusalem. When the Lord has completed the full program of latter-day events that relate to Zion and Jerusalem, then and not until then will he punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. See, the, uh, the, the Assyrian, this mighty northern power, this militaristic power, that comes to Zion, where the Lord says, I will send him against a hypocritical nation. And you don't have to look very far today in our beloved America to know what he's talking about there. I will send him against a hypocritical nation. And then he talks about the saints. Fear not, uh, the Assyrian. He's going to handle you like Pharaoh handled ancient Israel. But, don't be so concerned about it because I'm going to break his power in relation to you. But then he says about the total and ultimate things that it's only after he's performed his whole work upon Mount Zion in Jerusalem that he'll finally destroy the Assyrian. Now as you read the Jerusalem scene, read for example Ezekiel 38 and 9 where he talks about the great battle at Jerusalem, Armageddon and the Valley of Jehoshaphat, that whole scene. He talks about a power that comes from the north, it's called Gog and Magog, and it comes against Israel. And it's combined in its opposition to Israel with the powers of Babylon, which come in from the other direction. 
and all nations are gathered against Jerusalem. See, there's two major powers. See, one of them then is Babylon. The other is spoken of under various symbols. The great northern army, the little horn, the Assyrian. I want to come back after we've had a little breather and get into the Savior's explanation of this because he even gets more detailed. And it's by understanding the prophecies that the Savior quotes that you finally get the full picture. We've given you the general picture now, so let me take a drink of water and terminate this while you pass your questions into this point. Or would you rather wait, uh, Brother Flake, till the end since we're going to just be continuing on? It may be that we just ought to take a break and then wait till the end and get back into it because I want to show you now that the Savior is saying the same thing to the Nephites. And then tomorrow night we'll get into the Isaiah prophecies which really open it up. They really open it up. And then you can get into the book of Revelation and we'll try and do that Saturday. Well, let's take a stretch and read it. But it hasn't really come to them. But when you get to this situation, where warfare against Zion gets underway. And the Lord then ceases to sustain the people of this land. Then under those circumstances, as the saints are refined and purified so they can partake of and enjoy the endowments of his spirit or glory to greater degree, then the true ensign of Zion will begin to be raised. And that enzyme then is a spiritual enzyme. It'll also be an enzyme or a standard in relation to uh, righteousness in general, in relation to social uh, happiness and justice, economic prosperity, and a lot of these things then that are associated with the latter day enzyme. But at the center of the whole thing will be the endowment of glory. And if people then reject that, they reject that manifestation of the Lord, then, then the end result will be his judgments upon them both spiritually and temporally. Now let me turn, for example, to another of Nephi's commentaries. Nephi gives us information in 1st Nephi 14. But then he ends up with John the Revelator, and he says, now John's going to see all this, and he's going to write it, and it's going to be in your Bible. And I can't write it. The Lord has told me that he's been foreordained to write it. And yet, ne yet Nephi then comes around, and over and over again he comes back to that same theme. Now one such statement is 1st Nephi 19. No, oh, pardon, 1 Nephi 22, clarification. And he has this then to say as he speaks now of this marvelous work among the Gentiles, which shall be of great worth to our seed. And he says in verse 9, it shall also be of worth unto the Gentiles, not only unto the Gentiles, but to all the house of Israel, known of the covenants of the Father of heaven, unto Abraham. Now again, the Father of heaven, in the sense that we've talked about it, is Christ. But let's not disassociate Christ. Christ is not our Lord, our God, or the Father of heaven, except as he is the executive of the man of holiness, the embodiment of his truth and of his power and the revelation of his truth and power. See, you don't separate. Uh, the two in that sense. But when he's talking now about the house of Israel, making known the covenants of the Father of heaven, he's talking about Jehovah or Christ, unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now note what he says in verse 10. And I would, my brethren, that ye should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless he shall make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. Wherefore, the Lord will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, and uh, in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. Now let's stop right there. 
What does it mean to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations? Over and over again that statement is made. Uh, let me just give you a few references. Mosiah chapter 12. We're talking now about, about uh, Abinadi and his prophecies of the last days. And he says, for example, here in verse 24, The Lord hath made bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This isn't going to take place in a corner. This is something that, that every nation is going to see, and they're going to make choice, and there's going to be a great division. They're either on one side or on the other. And he says this now in relation to Zion. Verse 22, Thy watchmen shall lift up their voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Now he's talking about bringing again Zion, and in order to do it, he's got to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. Now another statement, and this now from uh, Abinadi also, and this is chapter 15, uh, verse 31, where he says this, and again the previous ver the preceding verses, yea, the Lord, well, let's go back, clear back to verse 28, and as I said unto you, the time shall come. When the salvation of the Lord shall be declared to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Yea, Lord, thy watchmen shall lift up their voice. With the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. His truth is going to be such that we'll have a unity, hopefully. And he goes on to say, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem, the Lord hath made bare his arm in the eyes of all nations, and all nations shall see the salvation of our God. Now, in addition then to Nephi and to Abinadi, uh, 